In this next part, I'm going to take a look at the origins of modern preterism and what caused it to come about. We've touched on this briefly already, but now I'm going to provide more of the details. Concerning this matter, you will always find that there will be both preterists and futurists who don't appear to care about the what, when, where, why and how of their school of eschatology. No evidence presented is ever going to change their mind. And this is a strange thing for Christians who are expected to study and scrutinize all, th all things pertaining to Christian doctrine. Christians are instructed to believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. What also makes this unusual, at least to me, is that both the preterists and the futurists are often quite quick to point the finger at each other as to where the other party obtained their principal ideas from, but when it comes to their own view, they are often silent over its origins or say little about it. And when you discover the origins of both of these, it's a no wonder why. There are skeletons in the closet, as it were. Now, to be balanced, I will also be speaking about historicism and how this came about. And I'm going to deal with that in a subsequent section called the History of Apocalyptic Interpretation. So I will be covering all of the bases. Here we read from Henry Grattan Guinness's book, Romanism and the Reformation, in which he says this, With many varieties as to detail, we find that there have existed, and still exist, two great opposite schools of interpretation, the papal and the Protestant, or the futurist and the historical. The latter regards the prophecies of Daniel, Paul and John as fully and faithfully setting forth the entire course of Christian history, the former as dealing chiefly with a future fragment of time at its close. The former, or futurist, system of interpreting the prophecies is now held, strange to say, by many Protestants. But it was first invented by the Jesuit Ribera at the end of the 16th century to relieve the papacy from the terrible stigma cast upon it by the Protestant interpretation. This interpretation was so evidently the true and intended one that the adherents of the papacy felt its edge must, at any cost, be turned or blunted. If the papacy were the predicted Antichrist, as Protestants asserted, there was an end of the question and separation from it became an imperative duty. There were only two alternatives. If the Antichrist were not a present power, he must be either a past or a future one. Some writers asserted that the predictions pointed back to Nero. This did not take into account the obvious fact that the anti-Christian power predicted was to succeed the fall of the Caesars and develop among the Gothic nations. The other alternative became therefore the popular one with Papists. Antichrist was future, so Ribera and Bosway and others taught. An individual man was intended, not a dynasty. The duration of his power would not be for twelve and a half centuries, but only three and a half years. He would be an open foe to Christ, not a false friend. He would be a Jew and sit in the Jewish temple. Guinness goes on. It is held by many that the historic school of interpretation is represented only by a small modern section of the church. We shall show that it has existed from the beginning and includes the larger part of the greatest and best teachers of the church for 1800 years. We shall show that the fathers of the church belong to it, that the most learned medieval commentators belong to it, that the confessors, reformers and martyrs belong to it, and that it has included a vast multitude of erudite expositors of later times. We shall show that all these have held to the central truth that prophecy faithfully mirrors the church's history as a whole and not merely a commencing or closing fragment of that history. And obviously he is referring to preterism and futurism at the end of this quote. And I am going to come back to and deal with what Grattan Guinness has said in relation to the history of historicism and I've already mentioned that this is going to be covered off under the section dealing with the history of apocalyptic interpretation. But for now, we're going to continue with our look at the origins of preterism.
Next, I have here a quote from Joseph Tanner's book, Daniel and the Revelation, the Chart of Prophecy and Our Place in It. Joseph Tanner says this, Next, we come to consider the time of the rise of the futurist system as we now have it, and the occasion which led to it. So great a hold did the conviction that the papacy was the Antichrist gain upon the minds of men that Rome at last saw she must bestir herself and try by putting forth other systems of interpretation to counteract the identification of the papacy with the Antichrist. Accordingly, toward the close of the century of the Reformation, two of her most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavouring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely, that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfilment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bring into prominence the preterist method of interpretation, and thus endeavoured to show that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome, and therefore could not apply to the papacy. On the other hand, the Jesuit Ribera tried to set aside the application of these prophecies to the papal power by bringing out the futurist system, which asserts that these prophecies refer properly not to the career of the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual who is yet to appear and to continue in power for three and a half years. Thus, as Alfred says, the Jesuit Ribera, about AD 1580, may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times. It is a matter for deep regret that those who hold and advocate the futurist system at the present day Protestants as they are for the most part are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. It has been well said that futurism tends to obliterate the brand put by the Holy Spirit upon popery. More is this more especially is this to be deplored at a time when the papal Antichrist seems to be making an expiring effort to regain his former hold on men's minds. And since the writing of this book in the 19th century, the same is now also equally true of preterism. Both preterism and futurism are the handiwork of Rome, and were clearly and purposefully developed to take the spotlight off the most dreadful system that has ever existed, that murdered and persecuted God's people for more than a thousand years, the Church of Rome, and all that goes with this. In the book called First Elements of Sacred Prophecy by T.R. Burks, we read this. The book of Revelation, by general consent from the earliest times of the Church, has been viewed as one comprehensive prophecy, which extends from the days of the Apostle through all the times of the Gospel. No exception, of which I am aware, can be found among the writers of 15 centuries, unless we distinguish those who turn the book into moral or spiritual parables of doctrine only. But at the close of the 16th century, a school arose of limited extent and influence, who confined nearly the whole two times adjoining to the fall of Jerusalem. And again, we remember when he says here, of limited extent and influence, that this was written in the 19th century, and the influence of preterism has grown since. In the Dictionary of Premillennial Theology, edited by Mal Couch, we read this under the subheading, Preterist History. A preterist interpretation of the Olivet Discourse began to appear in writers such as Eusebius, 263 to 339, in his Ecclesiastical History and the Proof of the Gospel. However, he did not apply it to the Book of Revelation. An AD 70 fulfilment of the Olivet Discourse is often held by preterists, historicists, and idealists, and I have previously pointed this out if you recall. The dictionary goes on. The first systematic presentation of the preterist viewpoint originated in the early 17th century with Alcazar, a Jesuit friar. Alcazar's work first appeared in 1614 and influenced the first Protestant preterist, Hugo Grotius of Holland, who published his work in 1644. These early forms of preterism were mild and undeveloped by today's standards. 
And on this point, I will add that you do, you do find some preterists that point to the fact that modern preterism is much different from the preterism of Alcazar. And so they use this as a kind of basis to try and argue that modern preterism did not originate with Alcazar and the Church of Rome. However, this is misleading. The underlying principles are, in fact, basically all the same. These being a first century or not, there, or not long thereafter fulfillment of the major portion of the book of Revelation, Nero or some other pre-AD 70 person as being the singular Antichrist, three and a half literal years of tribulation, the book of Revelation dealing with the destruction of the Jewish temple and Jewish nation by the Romans and then the end of the Roman Empire prophecy, and also the fact that God has provided no prophetic light down through this Christian dispens through this Christian dispensation. All of these foundational principles are the same. However, the details have been changed and indeed continue to change from preterist to preterist. Alcazar delivered his work in a very tight Roman Catholic framework, for it was the Church of Rome who was seen to triumph in all of this, and you'll see this in some of the notes that I'm about to read out from different commentaries. But take this aspect out, and it all looks like modern preterism. Additionally, Alcazar did not go as far as the full preterists do, but then again, neither do the majority of preterists go that far either. Concerning this name, Hugo Grotius, this name comes up time and time again when you're looking at preterism. Uh, Hugo Grotius was a Protestant, which makes the matter of some interest. And concerning this man, we read in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology this. In works such as Via Ad Pacem Ecclesiasticum, 1642, he expressed a desire for the unity of the church and was willing to make such extensive concessions to restore union with Rome that he was accused of converting to Roman Catholicism. The reason for his ironic approach was his desire as a Christian and a statesman to bring peace and unity to a world torn by religious wars. So, as we can see, Hugo Grotius was a close friend and ally of the Church of Rome, and so it makes complete sense that he would adopt a pro-Church of he would adopt rather pro-Church of Rome theology. In this case, preterism. Here we have a booklet by Charles Jennings called "The Origin of Futurism and Preterism," and this is an excellent summary on this topic. In this booklet, Charles Jennings quotes from the Roman Catholic writer G.S. Hitchcock, who wrote this. The Futurist School, founded by the Jesuit Ribera in 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. The Praetorist School, founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614, explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. And the source of that quote is shown here in this slide. So here we have a Roman Catholic writer admitting that both futurism and preterism originate with the Church of Rome. The bottom line is that Rome is guilty as charged and rather than denying it, she freely admits it. Interestingly, in Ken Gentry's book called Before Jerusalem Fell, Gentry lists over 130 writers who advocate an early date of the writing of Revelation. And by early date, Gentry means prior to AD 70. And on this, I note that for the preterist scheme to work, not only must the book be written prior to AD 70, but it must also not be written any time later than March 67, or else it blows the whole thing out of the water. And I've previously touched on this point. Some of the early date advocates in this list hold to a date later than March 67. However, the interesting thing about the list that Gentry provides is that he lists all of the writers in alphabetical order, but if you arranged his list on a date of writing order, the first cab off the rank is Louis D. Alcazar in 1614, followed closely by Hugo Grotius in 1644. And therein do you have what looks to me
to be an acknowledgement from Gentry that the first writer to put forward this view was Alcazar. And I will leave you to ponder this. As an aside point, if you were to read the list for yourself, you will also note many of the German names listed. And I'm going to speak more about the significance of these German names shortly. In the Jemison, Fawcett and Brown commentary Introduction to Revelation, we read this. Three schools of interpreters exist. Number one, the preterists who hold that almost the whole has been fulfilled. And then the commentary goes on and talks about number two, the historical interpreters, and number three, the futurists. But we'll pick it up where the commentary continues with this. The first theory, that is preterism, was not held by any of the earliest fathers and is only held now by rationalists. This would be the German unbelievers, and you need to bear in mind that this commentary was written in, in the 19th century uh, where this was the case. Since then, Christians have picked up on what the German rationalists believed, and we'll talk more about that soon. The commentary goes on and is now uh, only held by rationalists who limit John's vision to things within his own horizon. Pagan Rome's persecution of Christians and its consequently anticipated destruction. The Seventh-day Adventist writer Froome writes in his book, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, Volume 2, under the subheading, Alcazar Projects Conflicting Preterist Interpretation, this. Not satisfied with futurism's deflection of Protestant interpretation, and in a further but differing attempt to absolve the papacy from the stigma of Antichrist, the Jesuit Alcazar was moved to proffer the preterist theory of counter-interpretation. This scheme contended that the prophecies of Revelation were descriptive of the victory of the early church as fulfilled in the downfall of the Jewish nation and the overthrow of pagan Rome, and in this way limited their range to the first six centuries of the Christian era and making Nero the Antichrist. Despite his incessant activities, his 900-page commentary Vestigatio Arcani Census in Apocalypse, meaning investigation of the hidden sense of the apocalypse, the result of 40 years study, was published posthumously in 1614. In this work dedicated to the Catholic Church, he made a new attempt to interpret the apocalypse by this preterist scheme of exposition, that is, by the thesis that the prophecies were fulfilled in the past. Alcazar was the first to apply preterism to the apocalypse with anything like completeness, though it had previously been applied somewhat to Daniel. It thus pioneered the way for acceptance first by Hugo Grotius of the Netherlands and later by the German rationalists, as will be noted. Earlier in the same book, Froome said this, Rome's answer to the Protestant Reformation was twofold, though actually conflicting and contradictory. Through the Jesuits Ribera of Salamanca, Spain, and Bellamine of Rome, the papacy put forth her futurist interpretation. And through Alcazar, Spanish Jesuit of Seville, she advanced almost simultaneously the conflicting preterist interpretation. These were designed to meet and overwhelm the historical interpretation of the Protestants. Though mutually exclusive, Either Jesuit alternative suited the great object equally well, as both thrust aside the application of the prophecies from the existing Church of Rome. The one accomplished it by making prophecy stop altogether short of Papal Rome's career. The other achieved it by making it overleap the immense era of Papal dominance, crowding Antichrist into a small fragment of time in the still distant future, just before the great consummation it is consequently often called the gap theory. In the book by E.P. Cashmail, called The Visions of Daniel and of the Revelation Explain, which is quite a good summary and introduction to the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and is based heavily on the information from many previous authors, such as Eliot, Graddon Guinness, Joseph Tanner, and T.R. Burks, we read this. Alcazar, also a Spanish Jesuit of Seville, published a scheme which on main points is that of the modern preterist. This restricts almost the whole of the apocalypse to the catastrophes of the Jewish nation. 
In E.P. Cashimale's book called The Prophetic Outlook Today, we read under the subheading Oxford Tracts and the Antichrist this. In 1833 began the publication of the Oxford Tracts, one main object of the writers, soon developed, being to unprotestantize the Church of England. Hence, the change of opinion on apocalyptic interpretation and the gradual but rapid advance of the new English Futurist School during this period. The Oxford movement, which produced the Oxford Tracts, was a 19th century movement centred at the University of Oxford that sought a renewal of Catholic or Roman Catholic thought and practice within the Church of England in opposition to the Protestant tendency of the Church. So we need to understand that there is some real serious mischief going on here. As we have previously established, Protestantism and Historicism are inextricably linked. Historicism undergirded the European Reformation. Therefore, if you're going to start to, if you're going to work on undoing Protestantism, you have to start on removing its pillars, and one of its pillars is historicism, and this is what has been explained here. It was necessary to displace historicism with alternative doctrines, and those doctrines of choice were both futurism and preterism. While the Oxford movement promoted futurism, at the same time the German preteristic teachings came into England through Dr. Samuel Davidson, and Cashemail says this, The influx of German literature into England during the same period began to familiarise the English mind more and more with the most popular German views on scripture prophecy, generally preterist and helped on the abandonment of the continuous historic, or, as it may rightly be called, the Protestant system of prophetic interpretation. In the Horae Apocalyptica, Volume 4, under the subheading History of Apocalyptic Interpretation, the Romish apocalyptic expositors of the era and century of the Reformation, we read this. So at length, as the century was advancing to a close, two stout Jesuits took up the gauntlet and published their respective but quite counter-opinions on the apocalyptic subject. The one, Ribera, a Jesuit priest of Salamanca, who, about AD 1585, published an apocalyptic commentary which was on the grand points of Babylon and Antichrist, what we now call the Futurist Scheme. The other, Alcazar, also a Spanish Jesuit, but of Seville, whose schemes was on main points what may be called that of the holy praetorists. Either suited the great object of the writers nearly equally well, viz. that of setting aside all application of the prophecies of Antichrist from the existing Church of Rome, the one by making prophecy stop altogether short of papal Rome, the other by making it overleap almost altogether the immense interval of time that of Popedom's dominancy inclusive, which had elapsed since the prophecy was given and plunged in its pictures of Antichrist into a yet distant future just before the consummation. Later on in the same volume 4, Eliot says this. Now, with regard to the Praetor scheme, it may be remembered that I stated it to have had its origins with the Jesuit Alcazar, and that it was subsequently and after Grotius's and Hammond's prior adoption of it, adopted and improved by Bosway, the great papal champion, under one form and modification, then afterwards under another modification by Hernschneider, Eichhorn, and others of the German critical and generally infidel school of the last half century. Followed in our own era by Heinrichs and by Moses Stewart of the United States of America. So there we have it, the chain of events starts with Alcazar, moves to Grotius and Hammond, and then the German rationalists, or infidels as they are, and then lastly to the Christians. What a shame that these Christians of the 19th century picked up on the teaching put forward by the German rationalists. You would have hoped that Christians were more discerning than this. Unfortunately, this is what we find when we look into the matter and it is a great shame. As it says in Matthew 13, While men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And this is why we have both preterism and futurism 
in the church world today. Sad, but true. And so that we might understand that the issue in relation to German rationalism was not just some light passing thing, but was a serious attack on Christianity, we read the following from the Encyclopedia Britannica. The next wave of religious rationalism occurred in Germany under the influence of Hegel, who held that a religious creed is a halfway house on the road to a mature philosophy, the product of a reason that is still under the sway of feeling and imagination. This idea was taken up and applied with learning and acuteness to the origins of Christianity by David Friedrich Strauss, 1808-1874, who published in 1835, at the age of 27, a remarkable and influential three-volume work, Das Leben Jesu, meaning The Life of Jesus, Critically Examined, 1846. Relying largely on internal inconsistencies in the Synoptic Gospels, Strauss undertook to prove these books to be unacceptable as revelation and unsatisfactory as history. He then, he then sought to show how an imaginative people, innocent of either history or science, convinced that a Messiah would appear and deeply moved by a unique moral genius, inevitably wove myths about his birth and death, his miracles and his divine communings. This kind of teaching is straight from the pit. These people believed that they were their own gods. They took the Bible and ripped it to shreds. They denied the deity of Jesus Christ his virgin birth, his atoning sacrifice. Miracles were but superstitions, and this is what was taught in the universities and came into England and America. This also opened up the door for textual criticism and Westcott and Hort, the two individuals we have to thank for the plethora of Bible versions today, and these newer Bible versions don't help they hinder in dumbing down the people of God. And this is all part of the legacy of preterism. And please note that I'm not for one moment saying that the preterists of today are rationalists. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that the historical record shows that the modern preterists picked up on the teachings of the German rationalists who were mainly preteristic. In Ken Gentry's book, Before Jerusalem Fell, under the subheading, The Approach to the Question of Dating, he lists a number of rationalists that come down on the preterist side of things as it relates to the supposed early dating of the book of Revelation. Remember, these rationalists do not believe in predictive prophecy. They are rank and file unbelievers, and that is why they were attracted to preterism, because it parks the whole thing back in the first century AD and so there is nothing more they have to deal with. Problem solved, so they think. Here are a few of the rationalist names I have spotted in Gentry's list, and I suspect that there are many others by the look of it. Now, I won't bother trying to pronounce their names in full, as that would probably result in you bursting out in laughter, and that's going to be a distraction. From the book, I note these names. Bauer, Bertholdt, Credner, Dewet, Eichhorn, Ewalt, Luck, Tholock, and Wettstein. Now, with friends like these in your corner, would you really want to boast about it? But whatever the case is, it clearly shows the trail of modern preterism through the company of unbelievers. Also in uh, Gentry's list, we find uh, uh, Westcott and Hort listed there. I mean, the, this is some serious, unhealthy company on the side of the preterists. Both Westcott and Hort rejected Jesus Christ as the atoning sacrifice for sinners. Both these men believed in the worship of Mary, the Roman Catholic Queen of Heaven. Both followed Darwin's theory of evolution. These were rank and file unbelievers. And then I see another name listed there, Furman Abosit, which we'll talk about in the next slide. I will take a break now and then pick it all up again in the next part and go even deeper into this matter.